Okay, Bergson and the Holographic Theory of Mind. Continuing, part 65. Only 63 more parts than I plan. On Meyer, Stephen Meyer, God and Design, or looking at Stephen Meyer's book, looking at cosmological theories, biological problems, DNA. We'll see that we're back to common sense, that tuning a cosmos is going to be equivalent to the problem of tuning a mousetrap. We'll be looking for time and consciousness where it appears in his theory, wondering why there's no Bergson, and my thoughts on the killer's heel in Christianity. So Stephen C. Meyer, Cambridge PhD in philosophy of science. Now, Cambridge triggers me because I direct people a little bit to my comment on the Trojan War, which in the theory I'm uh, following was actually at Cambridge, which was the site of Troy. So an interesting thesis, but I'm not sure he's aware of that. So he's written several large books. This the last one being the return of the God hypothesis. Darwin's doubt, 571 pages and uh, the signature in the cell, 624 pages. So very large, very detailed, and he's becoming very respected, though not necessarily agreed with, but you've got friendly interviews with Michael Shermer, the classic skeptic, Brian Keating, this interview here, many others. Obviously, just looking at those books, it's a major defense of intelligent design in evolution. The first two, 2010 and 2013, are biological arguments. The last, the God hypothesis, a heavy look into physics theories and the origin of the universe, such as Hawking's, Tegmark's, Lawrence Krauss, etc. Many more. The question, does physics attempt to explain the origin of the universe mechanically, without consciousness, hold water? Now, I've got no real critique of Meyer, though some of this will sound a bit like a critique. I think his effort is awesome. I'm just going to hit a couple parallels with these Bergson discussions we've been having and show where he's limited. Meyer is limited, missing some larger points. And this primarily, in my opinion, due to his neglect of consciousness and time. He just didn't come at things from that direction. Oh, and Dudo's neglect of Bergson, whom he's never referenced, which I think is a, a Cambridge English philosophical framework uh, problem. Meyer is arguing from a Christian perspective, he's not fundamentalist, not six day creationism. And the observations I'm about to make will see, in my opinion, a certain Achilles heel in the Christian mindset, given how far he's gone. And this limits their effectiveness against the onslaught of the mind as a machine, human as computer, mind just neurons, philosophy, for example, the Sam Harris's of the world, where free will doesn't exist, spirituality is reduced to neurons firing away, etc. Stephen notes two mind shaping events in his era. During the late 1980s, two important books gained enormous prominence there at Oxbridge and around the world. In 1986, Oxford University biologist Richard Dawkins published The Blind Watchmaker, subtitled Why the Evidence of Evolution Reveals a Universe Without Design. Three million copies sold, heavy impact. From page one, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. In other words, we require only the undirected process of random mutation and natural selection. Or quoting from Mr. Dawkins again, natural selection is the blind watchmaker, blind because it does not see ahead, does not plan consequences, has no purpose in view. That the living results of natural selection overwhelmingly impress us with the appearance of design as if by a master watchmaker, impress us with the illusion of design and planning. Then in 1988, 88, Stephen Hawking at Cambridge published 
a brief history of time. So whereas Dawkins took, took aim at the design argument in biology, Hawking sought to deter, undermine the cosmological arg arguments for God's existence. 10 million copies sold, a heavy, even heavier impact than Richard Dawkins. So cosmo cosmological argument and biological argument, two assaults on the, the need for God. And in Hawking, we're going to explain the origin of the universe. A new law of quantum gravity explains the origins of the universe. So, circa 1972, before all this, I'd see having arrived the third mindset, namely the brain is a computer. And mid, uh, mid 1980s, and it's a neural net, which is the same thing, computational. And that a computer can simulate brains, AC motors, economies, rainstorms. The embodiment of the classic metaphysic. So Hawkins' thesis would evolve, so to speak, being extended by other physicists. And this is what Meyer looks at. So the origins of the universe. A nemesis, so to speak, for physics, no need of God approach is the fine tuning problem of the universe, also known as the Goldilocks universe. Everything just fits perfectly. The laws and constants of physics, the initial arrangement of matter and energy at the beginning of the universe had to be finely tuned to support life. Meyer describes this in great detail. That's why the book's so long. One teeny example to create the carbon that physicists are made of, and we're made of, the mass of the up quark must be precisely between zero and one billion trillionth of a Planck mass, or a fine tuning of roughly one part in 10 to the 21st, or just noting 10 to the 12th is one trillion, so one in lots and lots of trillions. Similarly for the down quark, tremendously fine tuning. We can look at it this way. I'm taking this uh, picture, so to speak, from uh, Hawkins. I mean, from uh, Meyer in his book. The problem view that as a view it is a universe generated machine. And so, if you're going to generate a universe, you have all these dials and twiddles and, and slide switches you have to uh, adjust just perfectly. The strong nuclear force, mass of the up quark, the electromagnetic force constant, etc. And of course, once all dialed in, you're going to generate a universe, except for one small problem. You just have to add in some matter too, because these are just abstract ratios. Something's got to generate, uh, well, there's got to be some matter somewhere, but nevertheless, you need all that fine tuning for the machine. How to defeat this problem without intentional design of this myriad of tunings? And constraints. So the creative approach to the physicist, the multiverse, in essence, a form of chance hypothesis for rendering the tuning more probable. Yep, something like random mutations. It posits many other universes and mechanisms for producing these universes. There have been several routes. The inflationary multiverse. It's a big bang and then a slowdown of the expansion from the Big Bang. The inflation mechanism is an outward pushing field with vacuum energy. The inflation field, as this field is called, can produce infinitely many universes. So ours is bound to happen. Then, and, I, and I'm just simply giving a high brush view of what my course is over, the string theory multiverse. The string mathematical structure has infinitely many solutions, each with a different physics. No problem. A mechanism was proposed for generating the 10 to the 500th, the 10 to the 1,000th possible universes. That's a lot of possible universes. Thus rendering ours a probable occurrence, again, just like, like random mutations. Now, what we see, though, is that the multiverse requires both these, the string and the inflationary universe generating mechanisms. Inflationary cosmology 
could maybe explain the fine tuning of initial conditions, but not the origin of the laws and constants. For new bubble universes that appear there uh, must operate with the same laws as their parent. They can't just arbitrarily change laws. String cosmology, well, maybe it could explain the laws, but it does not generate the initial conditions. Both of these require unexplained fine tuning at ridiculous levels. For, for example, one part in 10 to the 66 million. So given the long list of things required, a very bloated ontology, and he lists these, there's a long list of crazy things that have to be there for this to work. Uh, it's been compared to believing six impossible things before breakfast, a la Alice in Wonderland. So we come to the above, quantum cosmology. This started with Hawking. The theory is Newton's gravity breaks down at the Planck scale. Now Hawking used an imaginary time, t equals i t, where i is the imaginary plane, and he came up with a model where there was no singularity, just a giant temporal block, all the block time of special relativity. So an infinite block, therefore needing no beginning, so God needs no so no God needed to start the beginning. But the difficulty is all this is just math with no physical correspondence to reality. And even worse, remove the t equal i t and darn the singularity returns. There was another aspect involved with this, the, the Wheeler DeWitt equation. The focus here was the very small interval at the beginning, it's 10 to the minus 43rd of a second where quantum mechanics would be relevant to gravity. The first step in quantum gravity is Wheeler-DeWitt. So a solution for the wave function psi, you have a wave function for a particle or a set of particles. And a solution for a Wheeler-DeWitt, you've got a wave function psi for the universe, describing different possible universes described by psi, but adding the ingredient of different gravitational fields or so universes with different, differing gravitational fields. So this starts with Schrodinger's wave equation. This is the equation Sean Carroll holds can perfectly, without missing anything, su sufficiently and completely sufficiently describe the entire universe. That is a entire universe. Notice he likes the many worlds interpretation and he likes that because he thinks Schrodinger perfectly describes the universe, which we saw in number 60, Schrodinger in 1952, as he would have noted, would have been very surprised that uh, Carroll believed this. In fact, maybe Sean should have talked to Schrodinger. Because this is already a problem at the base of things, and at, at psi itself, Schrodinger's equation that Meyer is apparently unaware of, or at least never talks about. But ignoring this, the wave equation needs to get started. It needs boundary conditions set, else its universe doesn't work. It falls apart, it melts or something. Remember in our little pictures of, um, of this equation, number 63, it's basically a, a uh, chain, a phase space, a complex high dimensional phase space somewhat analogous to the uh, changing love of Romeo and Juliet there, where we could set a bound for the uh, growth of uh, Romeo's love, say plus or minus five, but you need to set some sort of bound. And we saw Schrodinger unsuccessfully struggled with the physical meaning of size, high dimensionality. Remember, each particle requires three dimensions. So for, four particles and you're up to 12 dimensions. He disparaged, also we saw, the adequacy of psi, particularly in complex interactions in 1952, to include its probability interpretation. So point being, there's some real problems at the very core of all this that, that Stephen never really looks at. So where at the beginning of things would these nice fine tuning parameters come from? Well, this is via wheeler DeWitt. A solution to Wheeler-DeWitt for psi 
allows calculating the probability that this given universe with a with specific gravitational field and curvature will emerge. The analogy here, Schrodinger's psi, the paths of a pile of particles, their momentum position, all in superposition. Wheeler DeWitt psi, the, the paths of a pile of universes, universes described by Schrodinger's psi, each described by Schrodinger's psi, each with a specific gravitational curvature and mass energy, all in superposition. So quantum cosmologists think that getting a specific psi as a solution that works, that is reasonable, that makes a universe that you can walk on uh, land with, out of a Wheeler DeWitt superposition justifies treating this as the origin of the universe. But in brief, Hawking and his partner Hartle were forced to apply a set of mathematical, mathematical constraints to the Wheeler DeWitt else there's no way to get a reasonable universe. In other words, you have to constrain the number of possible solutions. The constraints cannot be chosen arbitrarily. They have to be motivated, not question begging, not just to get your equation going. And this has proven so hard, it seems to have forced out another rather egregious error. And sees this already in hockey. To quote, because there is such a law as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. So interesting. From an abstract mathematical law, concrete stuff emerges. Interesting. Another quote from Hawking. What is it that breathes fire into the equations in a universe for them to describe? So he's wondering how actually this uh, equation set creates anything, but the first quote appears to have been his answer. Apparently we don't need the, the fire. This move is echoed in Krauss, who follows Vilenkin's Wheeler DeWitt based model from his book Many Worlds in One. To quote Krauss, the laws themselves require our universe to come into existence, to develop and evolve. Meyer causes a category error. To quote him, the laws of physics, physics represent only our descriptions of nature. Descriptions in themselves do not cause things to happen. And who was insisting on this in 1907? Hmm. We've seen this category error many times. The idea that computers can simulate anything. Take Max Tegmark, for example. Tegmark, the tree is just numbers thinking about the spin values of quarks, plus one half, minus one half. It's all just a matter of spin values, nothing but numbers. So, okay, make the tree out of numbers. It's no different than simulating an alternating current motor. It does not one run one Christmas light. That is, here you've got the motor, real concrete forces and dynamics. The Turing machine, let's, let's make it really concrete, it's doing the same simple manipulations as your computer. How, do you, how are you getting uh, the forces necessary to uh, run a Christmas light? This is simply unreflective enslavement, as I noted, to the concept of computation. It is the unexamined classic metaphysic underlying it. Absolute faith in the classic metaphysic. But let's take another oldie but goodie. When we looked at the holographic principle, where the universe is simply a holographic projection, so to speak, from a uh, 2D field, where the 2D field is littered with bits. It's, it's, it's comprised of bits. And so you're kind of asking, well, what's the laser? Well, that's our flashlight there. What's the reconstructive wave, the reconstructive light source? And Susskind admitted he had no idea, but to him he said, there's no magic flashlight. It's a mathematical process. So you'll have to let that register for a second. Again, out of pure mathematics, with the ones and zeros and all, we, we were somehow going to get a concrete physical world. This is the category error. So, but with respect to the ontological status of mathematical or physics and slash mathematical law, 
Meyer notes that this is essentially Platonism. But Platonic ideas, roving around in some Platonic space, have no causal powers to create. Again, same problem as the bits in Susskind's uh, 2D plane. He notes that it's reasonable to extrapolate from human minds and their causal powers to think, quote, if a realm of mathematical ideas and objects must pre-exist the universe, as quantum cosmology implies, then those ideas must have a transcendent mental source. They must reflect the contents of a pre-existing mind. This, says Myers, opens the door to a decidedly theistic interpretation, that is, to God. So Meyer is quite happy to have these laws in the mind of God, and it is God that breathes fire into the equations. But Bergson, we saw, the law, the mathematical order, has no positive reality. It is the form to which an, an, an interruption proceeds. And we discussed this in 49 and, and number 63 from a different angle. That is mathematically treatable, extended reality is an ideal limit toward which the intensive thrust of creation proceeds, never reached. And that extended matter is ultimately defined, described by the abstract space, the 4D continuum of points instance, underlying the classic metaphysic and its mathematical laws. Remember, again, as we walk, as, as we move an object across or through that continuum of points positions, it's described as a series of points. But the points are simply instants then and become in a, a series of such 4D or 3D spaces. And what Bergson calls extensity, that is the concretely extended world, is not the same as this abstract 4D continuum of points positions. Quite, it's way beyond that. The 4D continuum of points positions is simply again an ideal limit that is never concretely reached. And he, we noted there's two orders, the extent, the intensive, the inextended, and the extended. Where the intensive or inextended would be an, ex an example of the order existent in Ode to Joy in Beethoven's mind. Con the intensive existence of, of an order within consciousness. And the seeming lack of order requiring a physicist's mind's mathematical law to coerce into order, in reality, is the intensive order. To look at it from another way, Bergson argued, nature is no more trouble in making an eye, and we might as well say making a cosmos, than I have lifted my hand. Nature's simple act has divided itself automatically into an infinity of elements, which are then found to be coordinated to one idea, just as the, in fact, indivisible movement of my hand, or Felix moving there across the continuum, from point A to point B, across the continuum of points positions, has dropped an infinity of points which are then found to satisfy one equation. So you have to let that register for a second. Needless to say, this is a conception of God, consciousness, and universal becoming, which is unfamiliar to Meyer. And it starts with the nature of time, a subject which is AWOL in Stephen's framework. Time is indivisible flow, an organic continuity for each state or instant permeates the next that builds. In other words, the model is a melody where each instant is a note, where each note melds into the next, building a quality as the as the as the uh, tune the music evolves. When we've looked at the wave equation, we saw an artificial time at its core, a zero time, always returning to zero never building at its base. 
is uh, Euler's identity, which always supposedly comes back to zero, but in fact is nothing but an approximation. In essence, due to this emphasis on time, in this series we've been looking at physics wrought from within, looking at psi, special relativity, the measurement problem, but kind of tofu blocks in terms of building with them. And Stephen, more from without, looking at physics, physicists' use of their tofu blocks as a base and happily building cosmologies. But one can see that when there's a rot of all the tofu blocks underneath it, you're going to have a problem. But tuning a cosmos and tuning a mousetrap, in other words, the information necessary, is the same problem. This takes us back to an earlier part of the return of the God Hypothesis book to the biological dimension, which he discusses. And he's discussing a critique of his earlier book, Darwin's Doubt, in that particular section of the God Hypothesis. So Charles Marshall disputed Meyer's claim that evolutionary mechanisms lack the power to generate the information necessary for new forms. He argued that rewiring uh, developmental gene networks, DGRNs, can produce new animals from pre-existing genes. In other words, we're back to the problem. How do we trans translate, transition from beetle A to beetle B? New animal, new form, even if it's just a beetle. Now, developmental regula regulatory gene networks, these function like integrated circuits. They ensure the developing organism produces the right proteins at the right time. So we get the crab's claws at the right spot in time. The problem is, though, noted by Myers, you can't just rewire via mutations. They're always, these always, these mutations always destroy the network because the DGRNs are rigid logic. New body plans require new DGRNs, new gene networks. To build a new DGRN from a pre-existing pre gene network, you must alter the pre-existing gene network. But, now go back to one. But you just can't rewire via mutations because you've destroyed the network. Thirdly, Marshall wants to build new forms from a pre-existing, pre-adapted genetic toolkit. So this toolkit would have had to, have had to have arisen in the history of life, but how? What creates the toolkit? Well, no answer to that. And the information problem for Meyer, rewiring requires deliberate selection of parts. And he uses the rewiring or, of a guitar for uh, creating different sounds. And you need a deliberate section of parts, a configuration thereof from a range of options. Now, he notes that even just using the same parts as, as in this diagram here, nevertheless, if you rewire um, from 1950s, 1960s to the current wiring down there, each is a different configuration of wiring and each will produce quite different sounds. But that is that requires input of information. You definitely have to know what you're trying to get, what, what kind of sound you're trying to achieve in, in order to re rewire. Just as tuning a cosmos requires input of information, as Stephen constantly notes throughout his cosmological section of the book. Input of information. So similarly, rewiring DGRNs would require infusion of new functional information. Infusion of new functional information, as he puts it. So at least Stephen has moved to the more concrete, the more common sense knowledge level here. But let's get even more mundane. This is just our mousetrap problem as we've been discussing it. 
The physicists are just working at a higher level of the mousetrap, that is, the fundamental ratios, constants underlying the materials, forces involved in mousetraps. But they're trying to bring about the same kind of solution. How do you me mechanically create this set of constraints, forces, constants? The biologist, as we've seen, if you separate the biologist's discourse from their protein folds, genes, gene expressions, gene switches, force them to deal with the problem at the level of the mousetrap, that is, at the level of common sense knowledge, it is quickly apparent that they are just as lost as, a, as AI. If they understood how to solve the problem of common sense knowledge, they'd be telling the folks in AI how to do it, but they do not. The problem is the transformations, the folding, bending, twisting, positioning, transformations which are occurring over indivisible flows that are indivisible flows over which there are invariants. And we discussed how simply to move from trap one to trap two, which the biologists thought were so easy, involves an irreducibly complex, as Behe would have put it, set of transformations. You need all those transformations and they're over time, over a flow of time, bending the arm from the um, position in the tra trap one to its opposite position in, in trap two, precisely positioned on the edge of that platform so they can trap the paw, or bending the other arm, again, 180 degrees, and shortening that arm, and, and creating this the platform and positioning the staples and the spring so that it meets the tolerance necessary to have that arm position right at the edge, trap the paw, etc. All this must be done, but these are all indivisible flowing transformations over time, which is all tied to what Penrose called non-computational thought, or what Piaget termed concrete operations, or what Wertheimer observed. Remember Penrose with the, as we've said many times, his visual proof of a computation that does not stop the halting problem, folding hexagonal numbers into three-sided cubes, stacking the three-sided cubes successively over the previous cube, always making invariantly making a cube. Again, one has to see this over time, over the flow of time, else the globality of the transformation is lost over which the invariance occurs. The invariance cannot be registered. Like was for Piaget's concrete operations. The example of the tunnel, rotating the tunnel 180 degrees, three turns, a odd number reverses the order of the beads coming out. A even number, four turns, two turns, keeps the order the same. They come out the same order in which, which they went in, but it takes the child from age three to age seven, roughly, to discern this invariance law and, and achieve concrete operations. They're folding the uh, parallelogram into a uh, cylinder, asking for a, uh, so this is the cut it, to make it a rectangle to reduce an area, as Wertheimer observed of a five-year-old girl, a transformation over time involving invariance. And this all relates then to the cognitive fundamental operation of analogy, this basic operation of analogy, the creating of mousetraps, shall we say, from pre-existing, the old pre-existing components, just like the pre-existing genes, Pre-existing components, same argument, same problem. We're creating a, a um, beheading type trap for a mousetrap, or a crossbow-like trap for a mousetrap from these pre-existing components. But this all involves, ultimately then, dynamic and event invariant structures. The invariant structure of coffee stirring, for example, radial velocity flow fields, adiabatic ratios, inertial tensors, acoustical invariance, texture gradients, and flows. And we're seeing if a component, for example, a pencil, 
can fit within and support that invariant structure. Or same thing, projecting the invariant structure upon a component to see if it fits within that structure. Likewise, we're projecting the pencil within the crossbow trap or as a holder for an axe blade or uh, a razor blade axe blade, etc. All of this is AI's problem of common sense knowledge, which they cannot achieve. And why the problem? Because it's all indivisible flow, which requires memory, which equals consciousness. Because for consciousness, you must be able to bind or glue at least two of these instants or states of a computer together to form a whole, to form a flow. And thus, we're taken to the hard problem, the very basis of the hard problem. So all of this is the infusion of new functional information, as Meyer termed it. But you see what's hiding in that term, new functional information, this entire complex of, of um, concepts of descent on the screen here. And underlying this, that this, these invariance laws, which are defined over the flow or transformation of the universal field, this is information for organisms, not ones and zeros. That is the Shannon definition of information from which Meyer never breaks. So time is at the core of the problem. Time is indivisible flow, at an infinitely divisible space treated as discrete instance. This is an in principle argument and why AI will never achieve common sense, why random mutations or selection or self-organizing cannot create beings or forms mechanically, why the cosmos cannot be mechanically tuned. Meyer defends his arguments against the God of the gaps critique. That is, just because we haven't figured out things yet, we haven't had time to do it, you just can't bring in God as the explanation. Got to give us more time. Meyer at this point is arguing, well, God is now at this point more parsimonious than all the stuff you have to bring in to tune your cosmos. The inflationary stuff, the string theory stuff, on and on and on. The perhaps, but the in principle core of the problem is the nature of time, which Meyer never looks at. So Meyer does not go here to consciousness, to the hard problem, to memory, cognition, and analogy, AI, common sense knowledge, or to instinct for nothing in the foregoing gets this problem either. Well, this is all part of the same problem or to time. I do not think he can successfully because put simply to solve this complex of problems to provide a true alternative model of the brain slash mind at the scientific level. And that's where the battle is being raged, waged at the scientific level, maybe the philosophical level, but ultimately the scientific level. You are led to Bergson. And Bergson's framework is panpsychic, Zen, mystical. Notice the relation of subject and object. It must be put in terms of time, not space. And perception, it's not explaining how perception arises, but how it's limited. And this is a direction in which Christians, such as Meyer, whether Catholic or Protestant, do not travel with any ease. The Catholic Church put Bergson on the index of forbidden text. Why? For his pantheism. Here's a section of the index. Notice all three of his works, major works, Time and Free Will, Matter and Memory, uh, Creative Evolution, put on the index. There's Kazantzakis Nikos, Last Temptation of Christ. He happened to be a Bergson student down there, but too curious. Oh, there's Sartre, etc. Um, but for his pantheon, pantheism, pantheism definition from Wiki is the belief that reality is identical with divinity, or that all things compose an all encompassing imminent God. 
Pantheist belief does not recognize a distinct personal God. And that's where I think the real rub for the Catholic Church came in, anthropomorphic or otherwise, but instead characterizes a broad range of doctrines differing in forms of relationships between reality and divinity. But reducing Bergson to pantheism, not even close, but not to be examined here. It just no, yes, he does not discuss a personal God. This does not mean his philosophy is incompatible or ultimately implies such. He was carrying the argument on a scientific and metaphysical, metaphysical space and time level, where it has to be won, and where Meyer is actually trying to win. His implied theology, that's another and very big subject. The point here, neither Catholicism or Protestantism is comfortable with the mystical. This has been a long history of persecution of the mystics on both sides. This means, unfortunately, that both groups must, unreflect, must reflexively and incomprehensibly reject beings like Yogananda, Ananda Maima, Baba Lokanath, etc. And save via pure ignorance of these lives. This is not actually possible to reject the spiritual nature of these beings. So this leaves Christianity totally vulnerable to the march of AI, in my opinion, that is to the machine conception of man, to the Sam Harris's, everything's just neurons, transhumanism, a brain loaded with neuralink chips and cut off from attunement to the spiritual. And this despite Meyer's prodigious efforts. For in my opinion, it's only Bergson's framework to provides an alternative framework, concrete alternative framework to the brain, mind, and man. Couldn't resist a postscript. I was surprised recently. I ran across a number of channels trusting theism and defending atheism, each with hundreds of thousands of followers, three, four hundred, five hundred thousand followers, all pre-dedicated apparently. But most surprising, they're clinging to these concepts still. The problem of consciousness is solved by, to quote one, biological and psychological evolution. Simple as that. Yes, it's solved to an extent if you understand Bergson. Else there is no theory, there is no solution. But Bergson undermines then any simple atheistic position. And this is reflective of total ignorance of the set of problems involved, perception, cognition, memory, action, instinct, the hard problem, of course, all involved. Evolution, perfectly explained by mutations and natural selection, that is by good old straightforward neo-Darwinism. But the biologists themselves have moved on to self-organization which is also failed, as, we, as we've seen with Kaufman, number 64. Then, as far as the origin of the universe, no problem. Fine-tuning problem itself is not real. We can dismiss it. The Big Bang perfectly explains the origin. So, a complete failure to understand the nature of the fine-tuning problem and the status of physics attempts to explain how things get going. Now I've seen, along with some rather silly dismissals of the significance of the fine tuning issue, uh, I've seen some surrender to it, like one channel falls out back to uh, Russell it, under the guise and, or, or the topic of why something other than, other than nothing. He says, because I see no reason to think there is any. The whole concept of cause is, is one we derive from our observation of particular things. I see no reason whatsoever to suppose that the total has total, that is the universe, has any cause whatsoever. So, to quote a South Park video, it's gone. All origin problems, the fine tuning problem, gone, swept under the rug. Even if so, at minimum, this position would be useless for consciousness, the hard problem, or the evolution of forms. All things simply go away, it just is. It's ridiculous. 
more disconcerting and nowhere in these channels, at least as I've scanned the, the video topics, have I ever seen Meyer addressed, which I think is rather inexplicable. So how this mindset is yet possible? A curious phenomenon, if you ask me. So next time we'll see. Till then, signing off.